This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. This chapter goes through and deals with foreign currency. It's covered by the standard up there, IS21. Uh, there are several little aspects that we go through and pull together. Each of those smaller aspects individually is pretty straightforward. There aren't any ridiculously complex rules to get yourself stuck into. But when we get to the exam style questions and we begin to pull everything together, it does get quite tricky. And there's a bit of an overlap, if you like, between the different sections. Uh, in terms of your ACCA P2, whereabouts are you likely to see this? Well, obviously, we're in the group account section of the notes. So you could get for question one, 35 marks with regards to an overseas consolidation. Uh, but you could also be examined on IS21 as an entire standard. And it has been seen in the past as a focus question in question number two. So 25 marks entirely about overseas transactions, overseas subsidiaries. So let's go through, uh, give a more detailed introduction, shall we, uh, about what the standard actually goes through and covers. Uh, so there's nothing, if you like, in your notes. Uh, it's just there for you to go through and observe and, and see what we've got. So what we've got there, an odd diagram. Uh, but if you imagine the triangle to be the UK, um, and then the line represents the rest of Europe or, or the rest of the world, whatever you so wish it to be. Uh, and what we're going to focus on uh, is we're going to look at, say, a UK company. Uh, and first of all, we're going to go through there and look at what determines the currency that those financial statements are prepared in. So we can see there that you've got the financial statements prepared in pound sterling. Why do we prepare the financial statements in pound sterling? Uh, that currency that the financial statements are prepared in is referred to as the functional currency. So why is the functional currency of that UK company the pound sterling? It is not, uh, so that you are aware, it is not just because we are based in the UK. Okay, The likelihood being because we are in the UK, that then starts to meet those various rules. But it does not necessarily mean that because you are in a particular country, you have to go through and adopt the local currency as your functional currency being the currency that we prepare the financial statements in. Once we've done that, we then move it on. Uh, so having looked at the functional currency, we then begin to go through and look at what happens if, say, we buy or sell goods on credit with a business overseas. So there, what we've got it is a German company. It looks like the German company has its functional currency, is it as the euro. So if that UK company sells goods to the German company, or buys goods from that German company, the invoice is likely to be denominated in euros. Now, we just have an issue from the UK company's perspective. If they have a credit purchase, they need to record that credit purchase by debiting purchases and crediting payables. But we need to translate the euros into pound sterling so that we can then record the monetary value of the transaction. We then need to go through and think about, well, we've initially recorded the transaction. How do we then subsequently record for any changes in the value of those items that have been dealt with on initial recognition? OK, so that's referred to normally as the individual company section, because you are looking at entries that are made within an individual company set of books, i.e. the UK company and how it deals with any foreign currency transactions within its financial statements. Okay. Then what happens, the third and final bit that we'll consider is whereby that UK company has control. So it owns greater than 50% of the voting rights. So therefore it has the power to direct the activities of here, a French company, a company that has its functional currency as the euro. As that functional currency is the euro, as that company is a subsidiary because it is controlled, what we need to go through and do there is before we go through and consolidate the results of the overseas subsidiary with that of the parent, we'll need to look at what the group financial statements are prepared in. So here you have a UK parent company. Its functional currency is the pound sterling. The likelihood is that its group accounts will be presented in pound sterling as well. That just gives us the issue with regards to the consolidation of the overseas subsidiary because we need to do a little bit of translation of that overseas subsidiary, don't we, prior to performing any consolidation. 
Once we've gone through and done that, that's it. We, we've completed the chapter. We can go through there and prepare a set of group accounts that involves the consolidation of an overseas subsidiary. If there are any foreign currency transactions, either in the overseas subsidiary or within the parent, we can deal with those. And then there's also a discursive aspect with regards to, to discussing the functional currency. So the three things, just to recap, first of all, we will go through there and talk about the functional currency. So the currency that the financial statements of an individual entity are prepared in. Why is it designated as such? So why is the UK company got the functional currency as the pound sterling? We then go through there and look at transactions that are in a different currency to your functional currency. So looking at the individual company accounts and getting the transactions recorded there in your functional currency. And then thirdly, last but by no means least, we look at the consolidation of your overseas subsidiary. Again, each one in isolation isn't too technically difficult, but when we bring the three together, it can prove quite a challenge. So strap yourselves in. And I'll see you all in the next video where we look at the first two aspects being the discussion of the functional currency and being able to go through and translate the results of, if you like, a transaction that is in a different currency to that of the functional currency within the individual accounts. Let's go through and have a look at the functional currency. Now, the functional currency looks at what currency do we prepare our financial statements in. Now, it's not as simple as just saying you're a UK company, so prepare your financial statements in pounds sterling or you're a US company. So prepare your financial statements in dollars. There's a little bit more to it. There are, there are actually detailed rules within IS21 that determines the functional currency of your entity. OK, and what we have by definition is that the functional currency is the currency of the primary economic environment where you operate okay so it's where you pee yeah the primary economic environment that's what you need to learn first of all that's what the functional currency is it's the currency of the primary economic environment where you pee p w okay uh, and how that is then determined is whereby it looks at where you generate and expend your cash because that's where your primary economic environment is isn't it it's where you generate your revenue and it's where you incur your costs. So what you might have to do is you might have to look at some specifics within a question to see where you generate your revenue and see what you spend your cash within. OK, so what you've got there is if you're talking about how you generate cash, uh, one of the factors that we need to consider are your sales prices. So you could be a developing economy, maybe somewhere within Africa. And the currency domestically maybe is, is relatively unstable. So in order to introduce stability to your business, what you may decide to do is you may decide to go through there and invoice in dollars. OK, so therefore, the, the currency that determines the sales price is the dollar. OK, because you sell those goods maybe overseas. You want a little bit of stability within the business. You don't want to invoice in your local currency because people wouldn't be prepared to, to pay in the local currency as it's seen as too much of a risk. Uh, so maybe you invoice in dollars. OK, uh, so the first bit is looking at what your sales price is denominated in. Then we look at the currency that influences your operating costs. So when we're thinking about your operating costs. We're thinking about primarily. Being your labour and your materials okay it could be that you pay your local labor force in the local currency but again you might import raw materials from overseas and again those raw materials may be invoiced in, in dollars mightn't it okay uh, so again it could be there that even though you operate in a developing nation within africa it's looking there that the, the primary economic environment in which you operate it is determined but by dollar transactions i.e. dollar sales and dollar material expenses. OK, yes, you have some labor costs that are in the local currency, but that might be a, a smaller, insignificant cost compared to some of the others. OK, so there's no hard and fast rules, but you're looking at the majority of the sales and the majority of your costs. What are they driven by? And then what you have there is looking at, at your entity's finances. If you raise finance in dollars, 
primarily to support the payment of your overseas supplier and the raw materials, then again, your, your, your functional currency is looking more like the dollar as opposed to the, the local currency. OK, so, so here what you've got essentially is everything about your functional currency is driven by the primary economic environment where you operate. That is determined by where you generate and where you expend cash. The cash generation is thinking about essentially your sales prices and your finance. And then where you expend cash is looking at your operating costs being your labour and materials. Now this could and has made up brilliant small parts to a question, whether that's a small part of question one or whether it's part of question two or three with regards to specifically discussing for a particular entity what the functional currency is and why. So be aware, everything in the exam isn't just numbers. You know, the numbers you, you practice time and time again, so you get pretty good at them. The written, the narrative aspect will come with practice. And just be aware, this is one of the good narrative aspects, I, I personally think, to get yourself started with, with, within any question, okay? Uh, to help you understand how to write a narrative answer, okay? Uh, there we go. And the key bit is once you've determined your functional currency, you can then go through there, can't we? And then begin to record the transactions. Because if you've got transactions that are in a different currency to your functional currency, so if your functional currency is the dollar, and you buy or then sell goods maybe in euros on the odd occasion, you need to translate those euro sales or those euro purchases into dollars before you record the debits and the credits. Okay, And to do that, we're going to need some specific rules. And that's whereby we refer to things as looking at the individual company stage. Okay, uh, So what you've got there uh, is when you go through and, and enter into a transaction that is not within your functional currency, you need to initially translate the invoice before you go through and record it. And what we go through and do there is I think it's logic. I think it's common sense. You record it at the exchange rate in place on the date the transaction occurs. So if you were to enter into a transaction today, whatever day that may be, you use today's exchange rate. And that there is referred to as HR. HR, nothing to do with human resources. That's all to do there with the historic rate, the rate that was in place when the transaction took place. Okay. Uh, so once you've translated it, you then need to process the debit and credit. And once you've recorded the debit and credit, then that's fine. Again, if you then make another transaction, so maybe you pay off your supplier or you receive cash from your credit customer. Again, what you do then is you record the cash receipt or the cash payment at the rate in place on the date that cash receipt or cash payment takes place. OK, nice and simple. Again, it's logic, isn't it? OK, it's nice when accounting standards involve logic. OK, uh, so once we've gone through and done that, we then need to think about what we then do subsequently with regards to, to the year end. OK, and what we need to go through and do there is we need to identify monetary and non-monetary assets and liabilities. So everything here is looking at what is happening at year end, or to give it its true name these days, the reporting date. Because at the reporting date, we just need to go through every line item within the financial statement, so within the statement of financial position, and you need to identify what's monetary and what is not mon what is non-monetary, if I can get my words out, okay? Let's not worry about what's monetary and what, what's non-monetary. The rules state that if something is monetary, what you go through and do there is that you retranslate that monetary item at the closing rate. Closing rate abbreviated to CR. Okay, uh, Nothing to do with Cristiano Ronaldo. It's just a CR for closing rate. Okay? Uh, so if it's monetary you retranslate it. If it is non-monetary, it is not retranslated. You leave it, okay? So, uh, the rules is that you translate at the date the transaction take place. Then if it's monetary, you retranslate. If it's non-monetary, you do not retranslate, okay? Which begs the question, why and what's monetary and what's non-monetary? Well, 
Anything monetary is anything that is readily convertible into cash. So we're thinking there about receivables. Cash is readily convertible into cash because it is cash. Uh, payables and any loans. Okay, so receivables, payables, any loans uh, and any cash balances. They are readily convertible into cash and are referred to as monetary. So therefore, at the end of the year, if the exchange rate has fluctuated, then their value will have changed, won't it? So therefore, we will retranslate your monetary items at the end of the year using the closing rate. Non-monetary items is everything else. So non-monetary essentially is everything above your, your receivables in the statement of financial position. So inventory, intangibles, investments, property, plant and equipment. Those items that you have there are not readily convertible into cash. And as they're not readily convertible into cash, we are therefore not going to go through there and retranslate them. We're just going to leave them at their historic rate. So inventory, intangibles, investments, property, plant and equipment are non-monetary. We originally translated them, but at the end of the year, we do not retranslate. Okay. Uh, however, there is just a small caveat to that. Unless it's carried at fair value, uh, whereby there you translate at the rate when the fair value was established. So essentially, if you're going through there and have, say, maybe an investment that's at fair value through profit or loss, you identify the fair value at the reporting date, don't we, which might be overseas. And then we have to find out what that is worth in our functional currency. So we have to translate it at today's rate, don't we, the, the year end rate. OK, uh, similarly, if you have, say, property planted equipment and you value that PPE under the revaluation model, again, you will have originally recorded it at cost using the historic rate. But when you revalue it to fair value in the overseas currency, you need to go through there, don't we, and convert that fair value, you know, the revalued amount into the functional currency before you go through there and do the revaluation. Again, in order to convert that fair value to the functional currency at the end of the year, you need to go through there and retranslate. Retranslate at whatever the rate is at that point in time. Key thing is there's lots of translations going on, lots of gains, lots of losses, particularly when you retranslate your monetary items key bit there is that when you retranslate anything and if you have gains or losses, gains or losses go through profit or loss. Uh, they are treated as being realised gains and realised losses. Whereabouts those gains or losses specifically go, there is no specific guidance. We've just thrown it in there just as extra information if you so wish, just to put your mind at ease. If it's anything to do with a trading transaction, then anything to do with, say, receivables or payables, then throw it there through your operating costs. And if it's there anything to do with the retranslation of an overseas loan, then that there is a financing transaction. So throw it through your financing costs. OK, so there are the rules. Let's let's summarize, shall we? So remember what we do there is that if you enter into a transaction whereby the currency of the transaction is different to the functional currency, what you go through and do there is you translate at the rate that's in place on the date the transaction takes place. Then what you need to do is at the end of the year, you need to identify your monetary and non-monetary items. Monetary, you go through there and retranslate at the closing rate, gains and losses to profit or loss. Non-monetary, you just leave them there at the historic rate. You do not go through there and retranslate, do we? OK, if there are any gains or losses when you retranslate anything to do with your monetary items, gains or losses always go to profit or loss. There we have it. So what I do, just recap what we've done with regards to the functional currency and the, the currency that determines what you present your financial statement in. So that's where we P, the currency of the primary economic environment. Recap yourself about the individual company accounts and what happens there with regards to the transactions. And then we will rejoin together and we will go through there and have a look at the examples.